Hey guys, welcome back. Today, I'm excited to share with you a talk that I gave last week. This talk was given to a bunch of high school students who were all interested in going into a career in the health professions. The organization is called HOSA, or H-O-S-A, and it's just a group all around the state of Idaho of future health professionals. Some of these students are certainly interested in going into medicine, others to be a PA or a nurse or nurse practitioner, some EMTs, and others into physical therapy occupational therapy, and anything else that is related to the field of healthcare. The conference took place here in Boise, and over the period of two to three days, the students got to engage in competitions and other learning workshops to understand better the field of healthcare. And these kids are truly going to be leaders in the healthcare space in the future. And I was fortunate enough to be asked to be their keynote speaker at the opening session of the conference, which happened last week in Boise at the Riverside Hotel. Now, because I'm in medicine, a lot of the experiences that I talked about were pertaining to those that were going into medicine, into healthcare, and it was really about lessons that I learned along the way. So it may not be applicable to everybody, depending on which field you want to go into in healthcare. But if you're interested in going into healthcare, I think you will find some valuable lessons in there and definitely some things that at least helped me out along the way. So hopefully it's a valuable talk for you to listen to, and uh, you can share it with somebody that you know might be interested interested in going into healthcare at some point. And if you have questions about anything that I talk about here, leave them in the comments and I'll try to address those later on. Hope you enjoy the talk. All right, everybody can hear me okay? All right, I'm gonna walk around a little bit. Um, I don't wanna stand behind the podium. My dad was a high school teacher in Firth, Idaho. And some of you um, know Jesse, who helped organize the conference. Um, I went to high school with Jessie. She was a couple years behind me in high school, and uh, my dad taught her in high school. So, a um, little history there. And this is the first opportunity I've had to give like a, a real keynote address, so this is fun for me. Um, and I will um, try to give a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, so I want to get a little bit of an idea of the audience here. Right now, everybody's in high school planning to go something into health professions. How many are interested in medical school? Show of hands. It's quite a few. Uh, PA or nursing, great. Pharmacy, physical therapy, uh, occupational therapy. Am I missing anybody? Trainers. Athletic trainers, okay, awesome. Just to get an idea of uh, what we have in the room. And what? EMTs, EMTs awesome, okay. <laughs> so. Um, I am on all over social media. We'll probably talk about that a little bit at the end. Maybe um, you'll humor me and let me take a, a selfie with you guys. But I want to talk about just kind of my journey becoming a doctor who I am and mostly kind of some lessons I learned along the way that maybe will be helpful for you um, as you go through your journey and um, some of the things that I learned. So you're in the high school stage. Most important, you got to be having fun. You guys are probably way ahead of where I was in high school. I had an idea that I wanted to go into medical school or PA school was kind of what I was considering. Um, but you got to have fun. You're still kids and there's so much to enjoy and learn. So I kind of want to lead off with that message that you've got to have fun with what you're doing. Um, you're probably already doing this regardless of the area of health care that you want to get in is to take challenging classes, take those AP classes and do well in them. And part of that is going to help build your curriculum vitae, your resume, so that you can get into college, that you can get into you know, school, professional school, whatever you want to do. But also it's going to help you learn how to do hard things. And you're going to prove to yourself that you can do really difficult things because it's not going to get easier as you go further along in your education. Volunteer in all sorts of things. It doesn't have to be healthcare related at this stage, but you might be able to find some of those opportunities, um, especially with COVID. I think this was particularly difficult, and, and you guys can probably attest to that, to getting out and shadowing and volunteering, because um, a lot of offices locked down and they weren't letting extra guests in, so maybe you're scrambling to get some of that. But volunteering in different opportunities um, is gonna help you learn what you're passionate about because it can completely change at any point along your journey, and that's totally okay. Um, participate in extracurricular activities, and that can be athletics, that can be debate, that can be all sorts of things. That can be HOSA, you're doing that right now. Um, and that's important to learn to work well with others because medicine, healthcare, whatever it is, is a team sport, and you're gonna have to learn to work well with other people. 
Um, if you try to do it on your own, you're not going to be able to provide the best kind of care that you can, um, regardless of the discipline that you find yourself in. So when you, you're going to develop some of those skills as you get into these extracurricular activities, and you're going to learn what your strengths are and where other people might be able to step in and do things that you can't do, you're going to learn from them. Um, and it's important to help other people shine along this way. Help other people excel and do better because if you support other people, they're going to in turn support you. You don't want to be the person at any point along this journey who is taking advantage of other people. There's a term that we would use in medical school called a gunner. I don't know if you guys have heard that term. So a gunner is somebody that they're, maybe they're sitting at the front of the class and it is like every man for themselves. They're not sharing their study notes. They're going to leech off of other people. Um, they're going to, and this, this would happen sometimes as you're rotating through the hospital. Maybe you got to be there at 5.30 in the morning um, and they'll show up. You see a patient that, this is crazy that this happens. They'll literally tear your note out of the chart. Everything's electronic now, but even when I was in med school, um, we were on paper charts in the hospital. So they'll tear the note out of the chart and they'll write their own note so that the attending thinks that they did all of the work. And so they're putting other people down along the way. And everybody remembers those people. Sometimes they get what they're looking for, but a lot of times when they need help from somebody else, they're not going to get it because they weren't supportive of other people along the way. And I kind of already mentioned this, but learn to do hard things. Um, as you go through all of these other things, you're going to challenge yourself and you're going to prove to yourself that you can get through very challenging things and you're going to need to draw on that experience as you go further along in life. There is a pivotal moment that I went through when I was, I think I was in sixth grade and it was towards the end of the school year. And this was the first time that they allowed sixth graders to run in a track meet. It was like the last junior high track meet of the year. Uh, sixth graders could go participate. And my dad threw me in the mile race. And uh, I'd run some distance before for security games here in Idaho. And so, you know, I kind of knew that I had a knack for running. But my dad threw me in the mile race. And it was an Idaho spring day, kind of like we're experiencing today. So it was kind of miserable. And I took off running and probably went out of the gate a little bit fast. And I'm a little bit prideful. I probably never have lost that. And I was not winning this race by any means. I was a sixth grader competing against seventh and eighth graders. And so I got through the first lap and I decided this really sucks. And so on the back stretch of the second lap, I start thinking to myself, what would happen if I stepped off the track? Nobody would really see me over here. But, um, sorry, <laughs> I didn't expect to get emotional. I, th I think back on this all the time. My dad was running back and forth inside the football field. And he, he saw that I was struggling and he ran over and he started yelling at me to get going. <laughs> and he wouldn't let me step off the track. I was mad. So I come around to the other side and of course he's run across the football field and he's there yelling at me. And I'm like, dad, I want to quit. Like this hurts. He's like, get your butt going. So I'm going on the third lap. Third lap's always the hardest in the mile. It seems like it's never going to end. And he's booking it back and forth. He must have run a mile just trying to get me to run this mile. <laughs> and, and each step along the way, he was in my ear. He wouldn't let me quit. And I think back on that all the time. That, that was a pivotal moment that I learned that I could do something hard and it didn't kill me. I, I don't get emotional usually. Sorry. <laughs> um, but. It was, it was something that taught me a lesson about myself that I could draw on when I was in medical school and I was studying till midnight and I'm just dragging and things are horrible, um, that I could get through it and I was going to be okay and I did. All right, let's cheer up a little bit. <laughs> so you're going to be going into college soon. You're going to choose something to major in. Maybe you're going right into a professional program um, and maybe this someone won't apply directly to you, but I went to medical school so we're going to talk about that. So if you're going into PA school, you're going into medical school, you can major in anything you want, really. And I get a lot of questions through social media, like, what should I major in? Some people are asking me what they should major in in high school, and that wasn't a choice when I was in high school. I don't know, can you major in things in high school? I think it's pretty general. No, you can. Okay, that's cool. Um, 
So I don't, I don't have any advice on that. But in, in college, you can, you can major in whatever you have a passion for. So if you love computer science and you want to go to medical school because you want to do biomedical research, that's amazing. You can do that. Most people are going to choose a science degree going into medical school because it's a really natural segue into getting all the prerequisites that you need and then um, getting into medical school. And so um, I majored in zoology, not that I had any desire to run a zoo, which is sometimes what people think. Um, and I went through the honors program. Uh, I was the first person to graduate through this newly formed honors program at Idaho State University and get a, an honors bachelor of science. It says that on my diploma. Um, maybe that's neat, I don't know. Um, as we go on, again, have fun. You're, you should have a lot of fun in college. You, you're gonna be sacrificing a lot of your you know, 20s and early 30s to go into medicine. And to college, you should be having fun. So this is where you're gonna to start to think though, what is your goal? Like what are you hoping to accomplish along this journey? Because you're gonna begin making decisions at this point that are going to either open doors for you in five, 10 years or close doors for you in five to 10 years. And so you gotta start thinking what is your goal? You're gonna to have to um, start to plan. Um, how many of you interested in health right now have been told by somebody, don't do it, don't go into medicine, don't go into PA school, don't, whatever it is. Has anybody been discouraged from, from following this path? I hated that. I, there's so many people that are in your ear telling you, don't do it, it's not worth it. Um, and so here's a couple scenarios that I face, just so you know. So somebody from my hometown, father of one of my friends, um, kept telling me that he had a nephew's uncles, brothers, cousins that went into medicine and just absolutely hated it. And it was horrible and all this. And, and I just saw this person and I thought, you're clearly not happy in your life. Like you made decisions that you're not happy with now. Um, and I, I just felt like they were just telling me, take the safe route, take the easy thing, don't challenge yourself. And I, that, I just flat out rejected that type of adv advice. So, um, but there's gonna be people like that that are not happy in their life and they're gonna discourage you from following your passions because at some point they gave up. Uh, don't be that person. You don't have to go into medicine, but don't be that person who gives up on something that you're passionate about. Surprisingly, my pre-health advisor, I went to Idaho State University, discouraged me from going to medical school. Um, you have to get an interview with the pre-health committee and they have to write a letter of recommendation for you. And then I sat down with them and they wrote in my letter that I didn't have a passion for medicine. And I was so upset and I was determined to prove them wrong. Uh, I think that I've done that. Um, but that was the advice that I got. So I think that was very inappropriate for my pre-health advisor. But even at that stage, you don't have to listen to them. I know another doctor in Idaho Falls and he completely circumvented the whole process of his pre-health committee and he went to medical school at Mayo Clinic and has done amazing things. Um, this one, caused me to pause and think. My organic chemistry professor. I loved organic chemistry. And if you're going into professional school that requires a graduate degree, you're probably gonna have to pass through organic chemistry and it's going to be horrible. <laughs> Everybody seems to hate it. But I ended up loving it because I had a phenomenal teacher who really wanted us to understand and he taught us in a way that really helped me to understand. But he knew that everybody, he knew that everybody that was taking his class was going into medical school or PA school. And he would always, at some point during the semester, pull us into his office one at a time um, and sit us down and give us this piece of advice, which I've remembered and, and tried to implement. But he said, you should use your education to simplify your life. Like, why are you gonna spend this you know, many years? And his goal was to get us all to become college professors, he thought. <laughs> Being in academics was a great career. He was very happy. He had a great work-life balance. And he could see a lot of these students that were very bright, very determined, who were going to work 80 hours a week for the rest of their lives, have terrible work-life balance, um, have the highest divorce rate among many professions. And so he said, use education to simplify your life. And he really got me to think about that. And I said, thanks, that's great advice. I'm going to medical school. Um, but I tried to make some other decisions along the way, like becoming a dermatologist that I think have simplified my life. Um, and I'll tell this story real quick. Just a lot of people sometimes ask me, why did you go to medical school? And 
The short answer that I like to give uh, just for fun is that a fortune cookie told me to. Uh, and that for real. So I was, <laughs> I was a, probably a junior in high school and I was getting close to that time where I had to decide like, am I gonna register for the MCAT? Am I really gonna do this? And my, my roommate, he um, was for sure going to medical school and I thought, well, if Dan can do it, I can do it. Um, and I, was, I would go to this Chinese restaurant sometimes on Sunday evenings and, uh, and I would eat and I would study a little bit. And my fortune cookie, it's still in my wallet to this day, said, you could prosper in the field of medicine, which is so random. Um, I took it home, I taped it to my study desk, and it was there for my entire medical school. And then I, the desk was falling apart. I took it out, and I, I put it in my wallet, and I've held on to that fortune cookie for now like 15 years. So just kind of a funny thing. So as we continue to go through college, um, the question that you have to ask yourself, and the, again, this is mostly applicable to medical school, maybe PA school, is can you see yourself doing anything else? If you can, you should do that thing. Um, if you can't see yourself doing anything else, you're going to be a phenomenal physician. Um, but you have to ask yourself that question, and you're going to start to, again, make decisions to set yourself up for success. So you're gonna to try to participate in research. I worked in a lab. We were doing some really cool work on a drug called thalidomide. Some of you may have heard of thalidomide, um, trying to understand the mechanism of action. We were doing microsurgery on chick embryos um, when we were treating them with thalidomide and different enantiomers of thalidomide and then grafting them into other chick embryos to see if they would grow a third wing or if they would have uh, the wing wouldn't grow. And, uh, and it was just super cool stuff. But it gave me a better understanding of the scientific process and uh, was lots of fun. You're going to network. You're going to start to connect with people. Depending on where you go to college, there may be more or less opportunities for networking. If you're at a place where there is a medical school, you may be able to um, network with people in the medical school. Some of the professors are different things. And then again, you should continue to volunteer. And this is where you're gonna to start to get a little bit more specific with your volunteering, where you wanna volunteer at the free clinic, you wanna volunteer at the emergency room, things like that. I um, volunteered as a patient advocate in the emergency room um, in Pocatello, where I went to school at Idaho State. And they were great to me. I got to go in and visit with patients when doctors weren't there, you know, just do simple things like bring them water. Uh, they had, you know, teddy bears you could bring to kids if they were in there. But then anytime something cool came through, uh, if I just asked, they let me go, you know, follow it to the procedure room. So I got to watch brain surgery. I got to watch a guy who swallowed a nail. They, they scoped him and they reached all the way into the furthest reaches of his duodenum and they pulled out this nail and it was super cool. And um, so volunteer and you're going to get cool opportunities. And then remember at any point, it's okay to change your mind. Um, in college, you'd rather change your mind at that point than to get too far along in that journey, uh, be two, three hundred thousand dollars in debt and then realize you hate it. So, so as we're continuing on this journey, um, let's talk about medical school a little bit. So in my opinion, the work of medical school is not hard, but the volume is overwhelming. The classes on an individual level are really not that much more difficult than you'll face in college when you're taking physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, things like that. But instead of taking 12 to 16 credits, you're now taking 25 to 30 credits a semester. So it's just a sheer volume thing. There will be the opportunity for extracurricular activities and clubs. Get involved in any club that you have any peripheral interest in. So I went to medical school with the intention of becoming an emergency room physician. So I was in the ER club. Uh, I had shadowed a dermatologist. I thought that looked kind of cool. So I joined the derm club. Um, and I joined two or three other clubs based on things that I was interested in just to start to give me exposure because they'll bring in speakers that'll talk to you and give you more information and give you experiences like a casting clinic for the ER, um, ER club where we got to put ourselves in casts and, and just fun opportunities. You're going to start to narrow your choice of specialty at this point. And again, some of this may not be applicable to everybody who's not planning to go to medical school, but that's what I did, so we'll talk about it. Um, you're going to start to narrow your choice a little bit, but you don't have to make that ultimate choice at this point. And then you'll have a decision to make, what are you going to do between your first and second year of medical school? That's the last free summer that you'll have, so you can enjoy that. Or you can go take advantage of research opportunities that most med schools have. I opted for um, research at that point. Um, and did some really cool things with functional MRI imaging. And if you get the opportunity to publish, it's kind of challenging to do, whether it's in college or the first and second year of medical school, um, try to take advantage of opportunities to publish, even if you're the second to last name on that paper. Getting publications is gonna help. 
if you can get a publication relative to the discipline that you're interested in going in, that's obviously going to be more beneficial than something that's not um, familiar at all. But understanding that process, learning how to go through it, the publications, the revision, will help you regardless. And again, you're going to know and draw back on those experiences that you can do hard things. We're going to go into um, rotations, and this is third and fourth year of medical school. And many medical schools now are introducing clinical experiences much earlier. Um, we weren't necessarily doing that at my medical school. But I want to talk about a few stories and some things that I learned from my attending physicians. The first rotation that I did, that everybody did in my medical school, was family medicine. They wanted us to have early experience with family medicine. And my first family medicine rotation was with Dr. Brett and Brian Coons in Castellia, Ohio. They were twin brothers that went into practice together. And they were great guys. Um, and I don't know which one gave me this advice because they were identical twin brothers, but <laughs> there's three things that you need to be for your patients. And this will be applicable to basically anything that you choose to go into. So the three A's. The first is availability. Simply being there for your patients will make a difference and you'll change lives. You have to be available. If you don't make yourself available and you want to take care of patients, you've already failed from the get-go. The second most important thing was affability, likability. Being someone that your patients can relate to, that they feel comfortable talking to, that they can open up to. And that's going to be the next most important thing. And then the third most important thing is ability. Are you a good doctor? If you're there for your patients and they like you, you're going to be busy. Now, it's important to be good at your job, obviously. But when it comes from the patient perspective, that's the things that they look at. You can be the smartest doctor in the world, and if you have horrible bedside manner and you're getting a negative Google review, you're not going to be able to, you know, it's going to impact how many patients you can care for and how many referrals you're going to get. So that was just something that I've always tried to carry with me about being available, affable, and able um, when working in the field of medicine. Anesthesiology. This was the next rotation that I did. I had an early interest in anesthesia, um, the physiology behind it and everything. And so one of the first cases that I did um, in anesthesia is a lady had come in for a procedure called a DNC, or dilation and curatage. She'd had a miscarriage. And I'd never met her before. We came, I came into the room after she was already asleep. I didn't talk to her. But after the procedure was over, I went out with the anesthesiologist, and he met the husband in the room just to give him an update before the, um, the OBGYN came in. And this guy had an impressive beard. I mean, it went down to like his navel. It was such a long beard. Um, and he was a young guy. You know, he was probably in his uh, early 30s, if I had to guess at that point. And the doctor asked him about his beard. And he said that my wife and I have been trying to have a baby uh, for years now. And I've decided that I'm going to let my beard grow until we have a kid. And he had a long beard, so they've been trying for a while. And that was my only interaction with, with that person. And then, I, I swear, it's like an episode of Grey's Anatomy or something. My last day as a fourth year medical student, I had gone back to the hospital to turn in my badge and make sure I'd returned all my library books. And I came down the elevator. And I stepped off the elevator and I looked over and there was a guy and he looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. And I'm looking at him and he's, he's, he's clean shaven now. And it hits me, it's two years later, and this guy's clean shaven, and he's carrying his little baby out of the hospital in a car seat. Um, and his wife, it was just the coolest experience, because you could tell, like, he had the biggest smile on his face, and I saw his face for the first time, and I'm sure he didn't recognize me, but we made eye contact for a minute, and it just impacted me, the struggle that patients go through, and the small part that we get to play in helping them along that journey. So I didn't become an anesthesiologist, but that was just a, a, just a cool moment along the journey. And it just taught me something about the, the emotional toll that patients can go through. Internal medicine. This was, I, had, I had a really cool internal medicine um, attending, and I can't remember his name for the life of me right now. Um, he was a cardiologist in China. And then he came over to the States, and he had to repeat his internal medicine residency because we didn't recognize training that happened in China. You can go to medical school in a foreign country, but you have to do your residency in America if you want to practice in America. So he did, again, an internal medicine residency, but he decided he was not going to repeat a cardiology fellowship. But we were talking to a patient once that was admitted to the hospital of service, 
And the patient had never had a doctor. He didn't take any meds. And he came in, he started talking about everything that had gone on in his ER visit. They'd taken x-rays, they'd done blood work and everything. And this doctor, he mentioned the patient. He was like, of course, you have heart failure, and we're going to be starting on this and this and this and this. And then he left the room. And me and a couple other medical students are standing there. And uh, he's like, what was that part about heart failure? And he, he had no idea what that meant. But he was now scared out of his mind that he was going to die within moments. Um, and so the important thing to remember is that patients don't know what you know. You have to understand the way that you deliver things will have an impact on them. And so I've tried to remember that as being a doctor is just because I understand something, just because it's something that I've done a hundred times, it's the first time a patient has understood that, the first time that they've been given that information. And so the way that we educate patients is very important. And uh, that was something that I picked up in my internal medicine rotation. General surgery. I loved general surgery. I didn't expect to love it, but I love doing procedures. Um, I had a patient once that had a perforated bowel, and I'm a third year medical student. I'm playing a very minor role in her care, but I get to be there in the operating room as she's opened up, as the area of bowel um, is identified that has a perforation. The incredible tools that they have to essentially take that bowel, clamp it, and pull a zipper, completely remove the bad part of the bowel, and anastomose the two ends of the bowel. Like, it's, all, it's such a cool thing and uh, clean out the bowel, make sure there's no feces left in the gut, get her on antibiotics, transfer her to the ICU, stabilize her and follow her hospital course. And I got to see all of this happen and I got to play a part. And then in, um, in my first or second year of residency, I think it was my first year of residency, um, my grandma had a perforated bowel. She lived here in, in the Treasure Valley. And uh, my mom's terribly worried. And I remembered calling my mom and specifically remembering this particular patient in her course and trying to tell my mom what was happening and all of this stuff. Um, and my grandma passed away. She didn't make it. And didn't matter what I knew at that point, it, it didn't necessarily help my grandma. And uh, so that's going to be a struggle that you'll have at some point. Is you're going to have knowledge to be able to help and do something, and it's still not going to be enough. Um, and it's just a humbling thing to understand is that there's so much we don't have control over. Emergency medicine, this is what I went to medical school for, um, is to be an emergency medicine doc. So I paid a lot of attention. I didn't ultimately make my decision to be a dermatologist until my fourth year of medical school. But in emergency medicine, it was a crash course in humanity. You're visiting with people at the worst point in their lives. Nobody plans to go to the emergency room. That was part of the reason that I became a dermatologist, as I like working with happy patients, and nobody's happy in the emergency room. But you play a critical role in their lives, and you're always there for the worst moments of their life. Um, so you have to be able to do uncomfortable things. We've talked about hard things, but uncomfortable things. I remember a patient that came in. She was morbidly obese. She had a strong family history of colon cancer at young ages, talking like 40. Um, and she was nearing that age, and she came in with a several month history of rectal bleeding, which is a very bad sign in anybody, um, let alone somebody with a strong family history of colon cancer. And she had a family medicine doctor that she had told this to, and that family medicine doctor had declined for months to do a digital rectal exam. Nobody likes doing a digital rectal exam, okay? But you have to do it. It was the standard of care, and her doctor purposely chose to miss it. So I'm the one doing that in the emergency room in the middle of the night because she's got way, way too much going on. Um, you, you're going to have to do things you don't necessarily enjoy doing, uh, regardless of the field of medicine that you go into. Um, and I don't know what ended up happening to that patient. But my first code um, happened in the emergency room. Patient had nasopharyngeal carcinoma. I come into the ER one night, um, and this patient's leaving with nasal packing. And um, I asked what was going on. The doctor updates me, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, um, had a nosebleed, and uh, we're sending him home, everything's good. So the next morning, the patient signs papers for hospice. They're gonna discontinue any additional treatment. Um, later that evening, I'm coming in for my shift, because I'm on the, the night shift, and we get a call that the ambulance is en route, patient with a nosebleed. Um, and so we wait, this guy comes in, and he had walked, his nasal packing had fallen out, the nosebleed had started again, and um, he, they called the ambulance, and the ambulance picked him up. He walked to the ambulance. The wife said, we're gonna, I'll follow you in my car. 
And he got in the ambulance and they laid him back and they didn't understand how profusely he was bleeding. Um, the cancer had eaten into his palate and um, he laid back and he aspirated and he coded. And he had no paperwork on file. And so we didn't know that he had signed hospice papers that morning. And so he comes in full code um, and it was graphic. It was, the, the ER doc apologized to me that that was my first code experience. Um, but it taught me the importance of having those difficult conversations and having a plan of care beforehand. And as I went through my intern year, I made it a, an, an important part of my admissions to the hospital working with patients to try to have difficult conversations with family members and with patients about what they want their care to be should they code, should their heart stop beating. Um, the second code was also, it's always a sad case when you're coding somebody. Um, the second code was uh, a mother. She was probably in her early 40s and she was found down by her children. Um, the children attempted CPR while she was on the couch. It was a very bad place to do CPR. You need to be on the ground. You need to be on something hard. Um, and the patient was then brought in and the, I'll try to not go through all the details, but anyway, successful CPR didn't start till she was in the ambulance about 20, 25 minutes after the phone call was made because it was a rural area of Ohio. And um, so the outcome's unlikely to be good at that point. But I was working that time with a, an emergency room doctor, emergency physician, who was very skilled, had an incredible CV, um, was national leadership in the College of Emergency Physicians. And he was having a very difficult time intubating the patient and establishing an airway. And the other doctor that I commonly worked with uh, was just finishing up his shift and he came in and the doctor said, I can't tuber, can you help? And this doctor did two or three extra little steps to position her head, to move her body just a little bit and got it on the first time. And afterwards he talked to me about the importance of preparation. This other doctor had come in and with family members and all that, he was just trying to rush through and get it. And he, he knew how to do it, he was very competent. But the other doctor took an extra breath Calm down, position the patient, got it first time. And so whenever you're doing something in medicine, make sure you're well prepared for it. Don't rush through it because you're gonna be able to provide better care, even if it takes an extra second to prepare. Because if you take an extra second to prepare and you can nail it on the first attempt, it's better than missing three times. I'm gonna talk a little bit about choosing a specialty. Um, are we okay on time? I'm not even paying attention. We're good? Okay. Um, the thing that you're passionate about is what you're going to enjoy doing for the rest of your career. Um, there's a lot of really cool things you can do in medicine, but you're not going to enjoy all of them for the entirety of your career. And so finding something that you're passionate about, that you can look forward to going to work every day, um, is very important. So you want to ask everybody else that you see, um, who's the happiest doctors that you know? Who's the most unhappy doctors that you know? Um, do you love what you do? If you could do another specialty, what would you do? And start to aggregate that information in your mind. Um, and uh, when I was shadowing that dermatologist in college, I asked him these questions and he said, well, I've never met an unhappy dermatologist. And that's why I picked dermatology. And that stuck with me. Um, you should attempt to get into whatever specialty you want. You have to go for it, but you gotta be realistic because the decision of what specialty you're going to become started years ago when you were doing research, when you were volunteering. Did you open doors for yourself or did you close doors? Um, that's all happening now in what you're doing here, being here in Jose. You're opening doors for yourself down the road. It's a long play. It's delayed gratification and it's hard, but you're doing the work. You're setting habits and behaviors now that are gonna serve you well into the future. And then, this is a question that I tried to ask myself. Are you going to love what you do as if you were getting paid half as much? Because the reality is medicine is changing. Reimbursements will not keep up with inflation. So you're going to make less now than the doctors that worked in the 90s that could bill Medicare, whatever they wanted, and get paid for it. Um, so are you going to love it considering those pay cuts? You have to think about those things because neurosurgery looks awesome. You know, a million and a half dollars a year is great. But what if they cut that in half and you're still working 80, 90 hours a week, sometimes more? Um, if you want to be a neurosurgeon, absolutely go for it. Those, those guys are the rock stars. Um, grades and boards, obviously important. You have to do well in school in order to open those doors for you. 
Networking is key in choosing a specialty. And I think this is where I was best served is by networking. I didn't enjoy doing research, but I did research. I didn't enjoy trying to publish, but I did it because it was a necessary step and it taught me great things. But going to meetings, networking, meeting people like you're doing here, um, you're gonna run into a lot of these same people. If you're going to medical school or PA school, you're gonna bump into each other at interviews, um, on clinical rotations, on different things. So networking and getting to know people um, is going to be highly important. When I wanted to go into dermatology, I'd eventually decided that. Um, I had networked with a resident in this program. I applied to their internship. And this program had a, had a habit of taking interns from their own hospital into the dermatology residency. So if you got the internship, you were gonna get into the dermatology residency um, most of the time. And so I remember I was uh, doing something for the medical school, um, speaking to another group of people, and I got a text message from this resident and said, hey, are you showing up to interviews today? And I was like, what interview? Like, <laughs> what's going on? And he's like, well, yeah, you were supposed to be here to interview. And I'm like, I'm four hours away. I never got an invitation. So he did some digging. It turns out that the doctor that was doing the interviews was handed a stack of 12 applicants, decided, I don't want to interview 12 people. Let's just randomly cut the deck in half. And um, I'm just going to interview six. And I was cut out just randomly. And so I, I, was, I was so disappointed. And I thought, this was my one chance to become a dermatologist. And... Um, but I persevered, I went through, and I remember going to that program. I thought about canceling the rotation, but I had networked, I had met a couple people there, and as I was doing my rotation, I was, I was busting my butt for this program. Um, one of the attendings, we were doing a Mohs surgery, started asking me interview style questions. I wasn't expecting, he asked me a whole bunch of different stuff. And uh, I didn't, he's like, where are you gonna go for internship? And this is like a week from match day or uh, when the computer system closes, you can't change anything. And I was like, well, I was really hoping to come here, but I didn't get an interview. And uh, he's like, do you wanna come here? I was like, yeah, I would love to come here. And then um, we finished the surgery, I was back out. And then the chief resident comes up to me and he hands me a piece of paper and it was their rank order list. And all of a sudden I was on the top of the rank order list. And so, just networking and showing up and working hard, even through disappointments, ended up getting me that internship spot and um, becoming a dermatologist. And I felt awful because I knew the person that got bumped off the list when I got moved up, but she became a dermatologist anyway. So I didn't feel so bad after that. Um, audition rotation, so you're in medical school and you're gonna be going out to programs that you're interested in. Um, these are just things that are gonna serve you well in life in general. It's not just specific to audition rotations, but show up early, stay late, help the residents, help the people that are there. Whatever you can do to make their life easier um, is going to leave an impression on them. You're gonna be, again, lifting other people up like we talked about earlier. You're gonna be helping them with their publications. And you make them look good, they're gonna remember that when it's time to select in individuals to interview. Don't sit down. One of the least impressive things that we would see on rotations when people would come through is they would get tired and they would sit down. We'd be you know, examining a patient and they're sitting in the corner on the chair. It just, it's a bad look. Um, wear your compression socks when you're on your feet all day. It'll make a world of difference. Just advice, um, not just from a dermatologist because we love compression socks, but um, <laughs> it's just good advice when you're on your feet all day and you're trying to impress people. It's gonna make a difference in how you feel. Um, you're gonna be asked to give presentations nail the presentations. We had somebody, we assigned them a topic of uh, pigmented lesions. Uh, we wanna know is it melanoma or not? So she ran through this differential of everything that could be a pigmented lesion, a brown spot on your skin. And it was just sloppy. And one of the things she included was a chocolate chip, like make sure the patient doesn't have chocolate on their face. And it was just so weird. Uh, <laughs> but nail your presentations, know the material, um, keep deadlines. If you make a promise to do something for the program, you better deliver on that deadline. And with a little luck, you'll get into the specialty um, that you want. You'll get into the health professions program that you want if that's not medicine, because many of these lessons are going to serve you well. Um, in residency, um, I'm not going to go into a ton of depth on residency. You're always going to get busier. Right now, you have more free time than you'll ever have in your life. And the, the adults in the room can attest to that. 
you always get busier. Residency is busier than medical school. Medical school is busier than undergrad. Under, undergrad is busier than high school. So enjoy each step along the way. Don't look forward to the next thing to bring you happiness. If you're always looking into the future for something, I'll be happy when this happens. You're never going to be happy. You're always going to get busier. You have to enjoy each step along the journey. In residency, patients become your responsibility for the first time. You always have the attending there to back you up. But for the first time, you're starting to make decisions and recommendations. And you're going to be humbled again when you make a recommendation that is a mistake. And the attending catches you and says, hey, you can't prescribe that. It's going to interact with this. Or if we do this, this is going to happen. And they're going to, you're going to be humbled along that. But patients are starting to become your responsibility. Ask questions anywhere along this journey. I employ several people at my clinic. One of the most frustrating things for me is when people assume that they know what to do and they're afraid to ask and they get it wrong. Ask questions. Never, never get mad at somebody that's asking me a good question um, because they want to learn. So ask lots of questions when you're in residency. Attending life, you haven't necessarily made it. So attending life is still challenging. Life gets better in a lot of ways, but it's not it's not you know, some magic destination. So I'll give you a little doom and gloom a little bit. Medicine in 15 years, where are things going to be at? Almost certainly you're going to have less respect than physicians 20 years ago. The death of expertise is happening. Information is readily accessible and it's easy to misinterpret. Um, I, part of the reason I do social media is to combat misinformation. I'm all day responding to videos and things where people say that sunscreen causes skin cancer. Don't use sunscreen. Um, you know, don't do this cancer treatment, uh, you need to just be vegan and that's going to cure your cancer. Um, no offense to the vegans out there, it's great, but it's not going to cure cancer. Um, almost certainly you're going to see lower incomes in medicine in all areas because there is a finite pool of money available to pay for health care and we're rapidly um, using that. And so especially with inflation, um, you're going to see lower income. So you do not go into medicine for the money. It's, everybody will tell you that's a horrible idea um, because then you're going to be really miserable when your income gets cut. Almost certainly you're going to see increasing workloads and hoops to jump through. Um, government and insurances are going to continue to burden you with regulations in an attempt to cut their you know, payrolls. They're trying to not have to pay out as much. And if you don't jump through the hoops and you don't qualify for payments, you're going to be providing free care. And it's, it's just hard sometimes. And all you want to do is sit there and take care of the patient. So it's, it's hard. Um, there's going to be more of that happening in the future. And almost certainly, you're going to see um, non-physicians telling you how to practice, administrators, people in suits, business people that have never taken a class in medicine. They're, They've got you know, great credentials, they're well educated, but they don't know what it's like to sit in front of a person and hold their hand and tell them they have cancer. Also, medicine in 15 years, you're gonna change lives. You're gonna save lives. And your expertise will be more important than at any time it ever has been. And you're gonna be fighting battles on misinformation all the time. You're going to be proud to join a community of physicians and healthcare providers who entered this noble profession for the right reasons. Can you see yourself doing anything else? And if the answer is no, you're going to be an amazing healthcare provider in whatever capacity you choose. And you're going to create a life that you absolutely love, despite all the hardships that can come along with it. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm happy to take two or three questions. I don't know if we have a microphone going around or not, or what's going to be the best way to do that. Do you want this one? Question. <laughs> Stand up if you have a question, and we'll try to get a microphone to you. Uh, what would you say is the most influential piece of advice you've received over the years? Oh, that's a, good, that's a great question. Um, th there's lots of little things that just add up. Um, I mean, the, the idea to use your education to make your life easier was very important to me. And it played a role in 
why I became a dermatologist. Because I, I, I love emergency medicine. I think it's super cool. But ultimately, I made a decision. I like to describe it as 50-year-old me and 30-year-old me sat down and had a conversation <laughs> about what we wanted to do when I was 50. And 30-year-old me thought nights, weekends, you know, crazy things all the time it was really exciting. And a 50-year-old me was like, pump the brakes, young man. I don't want to work those nights and weekends anymore. Um, and I had done some good things. I'd done well on boards, and I put myself in a position I could become a dermatologist. It is the best specialty. I'm sorry to anybody else who's just passionate about something <laughs> else. Um, but that, that was very important to me. And then, you, you know, this is just kind of, it's, you know, cliche a little bit. You can't draw from an empty well. You've got to take care of yourself. Um, I never pulled an all-nighter in medical school. I absolutely refused. Uh, I figured if I don't know it by midnight, I'm not going to know it by four in the morning. And if I study till four in the morning, I'm going to forget everything I knew at midnight. So I had a hard cutoff, you know, the night before a test. Midnight was bedtime, and uh, it served me really well. So you you have to take care of yourself along that journey. Um, you got to you got to push through hard things. I'm not saying like take a mental health day anytime you need it. Um, if you have to have it, you have to have it, but you also have to do hard things, but you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to have some balance too, if that makes sense. So there's another question over here. Okay, so uh, as somebody that wants to go into like the emergency room and like those kind of situations, do you have any like advice for somebody who's like kind of emotional, like seeing those emotional things like coding somebody? Um, you're going you're gonna to learn to compartmentalize that. And I think you have to be ready for that. If you're passionate about working in the emergency room and seeing people through some of the worst moments of their lives, you have to be prepared to get a little calloused. And, and maybe that sounds bad to say, but you won't be able to function if you're going to cry every time you know, that somebody's going through something hard. If you can't pick yourself up and push through, and then you're going to do that. And after a while, it's not going to be hard to do anymore. And in some ways, that's, you're going to have to also deal with that, that you no longer feel the same way that you feel when you watch somebody come in with a gunshot wound or a heart attack and you have a screaming spouse um, or a child in the room or a child. I mean, the first time that I saw a child come in coding in the emergency room um, after a motor vehicle accident, I went home that night and I picked up my daughter and I probably held her for an hour and she was like fighting to get down and I'm like, nope. You're staying right here. You are staying here. I need, I need this. So, um, but at some point, it becomes easier to do. And that's a little alarming in and of itself, that it no longer bothers you the way that it did. But that doesn't mean you're incapable of showing emotion when you need to show emotion. But um, if that's what you're passionate about doing, it's just going to kind of naturally happen as you push through those experiences. Hi, so I am getting ready to start um, college next semester and I plan to uh, do pre-med, their program, and then go to med school after. What is one thing that you wish you would have known before beginning your medical journey? Uh, you know, maybe a few different things. One is there's, there's probably a lot that I worried about that I didn't need to worry about that ultimately um, didn't have a huge impact. Um, it still happens. I think it's less than, than it used to, but there's always this DOMD conversation, and I was real hung up on that. I was real worried about that. Um, I got real upset when I didn't get into um, the University of Utah, because I just really thought that's where I was going to go. Um, I had been out to Des Moines University, um, one of the oldest DO schools, beautiful campus, fantastic, and I got in there. Um, what I found over time is that it, you know, it really doesn't have to hold you back. Now, if you want to be the chair of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins, you probably should go to an MD school. If you want to take care of patients and do a great job, uh, it doesn't matter. You're going to be an incredible physician if you put in the work, regardless of the school that you go to. So I probably wouldn't have spent so much time worrying about DO versus MD. Um, it uh, you know, served me well either way. Um, and that's probably what I'd say about that. Just there's things you're worrying about you probably don't need to, and other things you may just not be able to prepare until they happen. So. Thank you very much. <laughs>